Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. Transform your online presence with the help of this ultimate platform for creating stunning websites without any coding hassle. Say goodbye to the frustration of complicated website building and hello to effortless elegance. With Squarespace, you can easily build your dream website, connect with your audience, and sell anything your heart desires. Their drag and drop interface makes it simple for anyone to create a professional looking website in just minutes. Unlock valuable insights into your website traffic with Squarespace's powerful analytics tools, gain a deeper understanding of your audience's behavior and use that data to drive growth for your business. You can also take your online presence to the next level by integrating email campaigns and monetizing your content with their members area feature. Squarespace's templates and automation options make it easy for you to turn email subscribers into loyal customers. Unleash the power of blogging with Squarespace's blogging tools, share stories, photos, videos, and update your audience with ease. So don't miss this opportunity to elevate your online presence. Start your free trial now at squarespace.com and receive 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain when you're ready to launch at squarespace.com slash brain food. And now today's video. American gangster films of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s have contributed a wealth of colourful slang to the English language, much of which is still floating around popular culture this late. Sleeping with the fishes, concrete overshoes, G-Man, Chicago typewriter, Goon Big House, private dick, speakeasy, Chicago overcoat, ride the lightning, fuzz, and many others. But while many of these terms are self-explanatory or have relatively well-known origins, one piece of prohibition era slang stands out among the rest. Stool pigeon, meaning a police informant. But while this term might evoke images of someone perched on a stool in a police interrogation room and being made to sing like a bird, the actual origin of this term is significantly more horrific, and it's tied to the greatest man-made extinction event in modern history. In May 1850, Chief Simon Pokagon of the Potawatomi tribe was camping near the Manistee River in Michigan when he beheld an astonishing sight. Quote, One morning on leaving my wigwam, I was startled by hearing a gurgling, rumbling sound as though an army of horses laden with sleigh bells was advancing through the deep forests towards me. As I listened more intently, I concluded that instead of the tramping of horses, it was distant thunder, and yet the morning was clear, calm, and beautiful. Nearer and nearer came the strange, commingling sounds of sleigh bells mixed with the rumbling of an approaching storm. While I gazed in wonder and astonishment, I beheld, moving towards me in an unbroken front, millions of pigeons! The first I had seen that season. They passed like a cloud through the branches of the high trees, through the underbrush and over the ground, apparently overturning every leaf. The gigantic flock Chief Bokagon witnessed was composed of Ectopistes migratorius, better known as the passenger pigeon. Once the most abundant birds in North America and possibly the world, at their peak passenger pigeons numbered some 5 billion. Their range extended from central Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia south to Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, with their main nesting areas stretching from the Great Lakes east to New York. A highly nomadic and communal species, passenger pigeons migrated across the continent in vast flocks in search of beech nuts, acorns, chestnuts, and other seeds to eat and hardwood trees to nest in. These flocks were often hundreds of millions or even billions strong and were an awesome sight to behold. One flock observed over southern Ontario in 1866 was 800 kilometers long and took 14 hours to pass overhead, while in 1855, a flock passing over Columbus, Ohio was so large and dense it blotted out the midday sun. To quote, as the watchers stared, the hum increased to a mighty throbbing. Now everyone was out of the houses and stores, looking apprehensively at the growing cloud which was blotting out the rays of the sun. Children screamed and ran for home. Women gathered their long skirts and hurried for the shelter of stores. Horses bolted. A few people mumbled frightened words about the approach of the millennium, and several dropped on their knees and prayed. When the flock passed two hours later, the town looked ghostly in the now bright sunlight that illuminated a world plated with pigeon ejecta. To give an idea of how inconceivably abundant these birds were, American nature writer and poet Christopher Kikinos has calculated that if the entire population of passenger pigeons were to have flown single file, the flock would have stretched around the globe. 22 times. Yet little more than a half century later, there would be not a single passenger pigeon left alive 
anywhere on Earth. When European settlers first arrived on the North American continent, passenger pigeons provided a conveniently abundant source of protein. Indeed, even waving a long pole in the low-flying flocks was guaranteed to kill a few birds. But so vast were the flocks that such subsistence hunting posed little threat to the bird survival. However, the massive post-Civil War migration of settlers into the American West drove up demand for food, creating a brand new industry of professional pigeon hunters. And right from the start, business was booming, as the Wisconsin newspaper, the Kilbourne City Mirror, reported in 1871, Hardly a train arrives that does not bring hunters or trappers. Hotels are full, coopers are busy making barrels, and men, women, and children are active in packing the birds or filling the barrels. They are shipped to all places on the railroad, and to Milwaukee, Chicago, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. Commercial pigeon hunters used every method at their disposal to kill the greatest number of birds possible. They shot at them with shotguns, trapped them in nets, set fire to their roosts, gassed them out of the trees with burning sulfur, and even poisoned them with corn soaked in alcohol. And it is among these varied methods that we find the most commonly accepted origin for the term stool pigeon. And any animal lovers or squeamish types in the audience might want to turn off the video just about now. Still here? Well, do not say that we didn't warn you, okay? One particular gruesome method used by pigeon hunters was to take a live pigeon, sew its eyelids shut, and nail it to a stool. Its cries of distress would attract nearby pigeons, who subsequently would be killed. It didn't take long for this practice to be associated with people who betray their own kind. However, while this is the most off-sighted origin for the term, there are several issues with the explanation, which has led lexographers to suspect it of being a false etymology. For starters, while stool pigeon was used to mean informant as early as 1828, when it appeared in the first edition of Webster's Dictionary, explicit references to the hunting practice do not appear until the 1870s, with the first known appearance being in M. Shield Devere's 1871 dictionary, Americanisms, the English of the New World, to quote, Stool pigeon. It means the pigeon with its eyes stitched up, fastened to a stool, which can be moved up and down by the hidden fowler. This 40-year gap suggests that either the two uses of the term developed independently, or that the hunting practice was retroactively applied as the origin of a much older term. There are also more practical issues with the common etymology of stool pigeon. For example, it is dubious that hunters would go to the trouble of carrying a wooden stool into the bush solely for the purpose of hunting. Some etymologists thus suggest that the stool in stool pigeon actually derives from the 16th century stole, meaning the base or stump of a tree, a far likelier place for a decoy pigeon to be nailed. Still others suggest that the term has nothing to do with platforms and is instead derived from the French word a star used to describe a pigeon used to entice a horse into a net. Indeed, by the early 15th century, the term had entered the English language as stale, used to describe someone who baits or entraps another. It is this meaning of the word that the sorcerer Prospero employs in Shakespeare's play The Tempest, when he commands the spirit Ariel, quote, The trumpery in my house, go bring it hither for stale to catch these thieves. An alternate spelling of stale was stall, which came to describe a pickpocket's accomplice who distracted a mark while they were robbed. This usage survives to this day in the phrase stall for time. As for the other part of the expression, the term pigeon has been used since at least the 16th century to describe someone who is foolish or gullible. Thus, it is possible that the term stool pigeon never had anything to do with hunting and instead simply combined two pre-existing slang words to describe a gullible person used as a decoy by criminals. Whatever the case, by the 1840s, the term stool pigeon was ill understood to mean informants, and it acquired the verb form stooling or to stool. Later in the 1920s, the term was shortened to simply stooly. But while the cruel 1870s hunting practice may not have given us a colorful piece of criminal slang, it's along with the myriad other tactics used by commercial pigeon hunters, contributed to a slaughter on a scale almost unimaginable today. During a single hunting session in Potoski, Michigan in 1878, some 50,000 birds were killed every single day for nearly five months straight. The birds were so abundant that they sold for as little as 50 cents a dozen. Yet people continued to believe that pigeon stocks were inexhaustible, with no lesser figure than great ornithologist John James Audubon stating that, quote, nothing but the gradual diminution of our forests can accomplish their decrease as they not infrequently quadruple their numbers yearly and always at least double it. 
And when in 1857 a bill was brought before the Ohio State Legislature seeking protection for the passenger pigeon, a select committee of the Senate dismissed the petition as unnecessary, concluding that the passenger pigeon needs no protection. Wonderfully prolific, having the vast forests of the north as its breeding grounds, traveling hundreds of miles in search of food, it is here today and elsewhere tomorrow, and no ordinary destruction can lessen them or be missed from the myriads that are yearly produced. Similar efforts at protection also failed, and the slaughter continued unabated. It was not until the 1890s, when passenger pigeon flocks had started to become noticeably depleted, that serious conservation legislation uh, was passed in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania. But it was already too late. Passenger pigeon numbers were in freefall. The billion-strong flocks of just a few decades ago were now a thing of the past. By the turn of the 20th century, the bird had completely vanished in the wild, with the last known wild example a female nicknamed Buttons being shot in Pike County, Ohio in 1900. In 1903, the only passenger pigeons left in the world belonged to a captive flock kept by Professor Charles Whitman of the University of Chicago. Whitman attempted to breed his pigeons by getting common rock doves to foster their eggs, but uh, was unsuccessful. By 1906, he was down to only five birds. The end finally came on September 1, 1914, when the last known survivor, a 29-year-old female named Martha, died in a cage at the Cincinnati Zoo. The passenger pigeon was no more. But how did this happen? How did the most abundant bird in North America, whose flocks were so enormous that they blotted out the sun, go from a population of billions to zero within the span of a human lifetime? While the unchecked commercial slaughter that raged from the 1860s onwards was the main cause, there were a number of additional factors that hastened the passenger pigeon's rapid demise. Among these, as John James Audubon had predicted, was the large-scale destruction of the bird's natural habitat. Passenger pigeons relied on large strands of oak, chestnut, and beech trees in which to roost, nest, and feed, stands which were being systematically cut down to clear land for agriculture and supply timber for industry. The birds' large numbers also worked against them. The pigeons' iconic behavior of traveling in giant flocks evolved as a survival strategy known as predator satiation, the idea that no group of predators, no matter how large, could possibly kill enough members of a flock to have any impact on the total population. Unfortunately, this behavior made the birds extremely vulnerable to human hunters, making them easy to slaughter in large numbers. Worse still, passenger pigeons were extremely social and gregacious birds, requiring large flocks to carry out mating rituals and raise their young. Once flocks size dropped below a certain threshold, whether due to hunting or habitat loss, its members became unable to breed successfully, dooming the flock to inevitable decline and death. This is why efforts to breed the last captive passenger pigeons were unsuccessful, and why recent proposals to resurrect the passenger pigeon through Jurassic Park-style cloning are likewise doomed to fail. The birds simply cannot breed successfully in small groups. Furthermore, the vast stands of food-bearing trees needed to support large passenger pigeon flocks had already disappeared by the late 19th century. Thus, even if all hunting had stopped in the 1890s, it is still likely that passenger pigeon numbers would have continued to decline. A similar fate is expected to befall another heavily overexploited species, the Atlantic codfish. By 1992, overfishing had driven cod stocks on the Grand Banks to less than 1% of their estimated peak, prompting the Canadian government to impose a total moratorium on codfishing. But it was too little too late. While the moratorium's been in place for nearly 30 years, cod numbers are still steadily decreasing, with the Atlantic cod expected to go extinct by 2050. Both cases clearly demonstrate the principle outlined by naturalist Paul Ehrlich that, quote, it is not always necessary to kill the last pair of a species to force its extinction. Recent genetic evidence has suggested that passenger pigeons may also have been victims of extremely poor timing. An analysis conducted by Pen Jen Shainer and colleagues from the National Taiwan Normal University revealed a surprisingly low degree of genetic diversity in preserved passenger pigeon specimens collected across North America, indicating that the late 19th century pigeon population grew very rapidly from a handful of flocks. This suggests that passenger pigeons were a so-called breakout species like Australian plague lotuses or Arctic lemmings whose populations explode in times of plenty only to crash once local food resources are depleted. It is thus possible that the mass commercial slaughter of passenger pigeons coincided with a natural downsizing in population numbers, further hastening their extinction. However, later analysis by Beth Shapiro of the University of California Santa Cruz has challenged this assumption, revealing instead the passenger pigeon populations were 
were in fact large and stable since the last ice age. Still, rapid population growth may still have played a role in the bird's ultimate demise. One theory posits that the expansion of agriculture and the relocation of indigenous peoples across North America both provided passenger pigeons with a new abundant source of food and relieved traditional hunting pressures, allowing the population to skyrocket right before the advent of large-scale hunting. But whatever the specific factors, what is undeniable is that the rapid and catastrophic extinction of the passenger pigeon was ultimately the result of human action, and that this ecological tragedy was responsible for the birth of the modern conservation movement. In 1900, Republican Congressman John F. Lacey in Iowa introduced the United States' first wildlife protection law, which banned the interstate transportation of unlawfully killed game. In his speech in the House of Representatives, Lacey stated, The wild pigeon, formerly in flocks of millions, has entirely disappeared from the face of the earth. We have given an awful exhibition of slaughter and destruction which may serve as a warning to all mankind. Let us now give an example of wise conservation of what remains of the gifts of nature. Later that year, Lacey's bill was signed into law. This legislation was further strengthened in 1913 by the Weeks-McLean Act and again in 1918 by the Migratory Bird Act, which protected not only birds but also their eggs, nests, and feathers. While conservation efforts are far stronger today than they were in the early 1900s, the unchecked destruction and pollution of natural habitats around the world continues to put thousands of species at risk of extinction. The destruction of the passenger pigeon should serve as a poignant reminder to learn from the mistakes of the past, for, in the words of explorer and naturist William Beebe, the beauty and genius of a work of art may be reconceived. Though its first material expression be destroyed, a vanished harmony may yet again inspire the composer, but when the last individual of a race of living beings breathes no more, another heaven and earth must pass before such a one can be again.